Hi, I'm John DeVore. Welcome to the channel. It is the end of the year wrap up. Happy holidays to everyone, whether that means gathering together with friends and family and celebrating peace and love with music and outdoor shrubbery and lights, or whether that means coal rolling down to Paranoid Pete's guns and ammo and stocking up on supplies to, uh, to fight the ongoing war against Christmas. Whatever floats your boat. Uh, we've got a new year coming up, which means we've got an old year to say goodbye to. And I thought that I'd just do a video about everything that's uh, been going on this past year and kind of get everyone up to date. The channel is going great, it seems like. Uh, we're up to over 16,000 subscribers. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone. It's just, it's so impressive. I never, ever expected this little COVID project to to get so big. It's not, this channel is not even really a side project for me. The video channel is more like a chronicle of projects and side projects. <laughs> Let's, I think that's a more accurate way of putting it. It's not intended and it never will be any kind of a source of, of revenue. Um, I've gone over this in a couple of videos before, but uh, I've only recently monetized the channel and of course, every video that has music in it, any ad revenue that they cut, that is generated by that particular video, none of it goes to me. It, it would go, it goes to the copyright holder uh, of the music in the piece. So, again, it's, it, this is not that. It's if anything, it's more of a vanity project for me. It's a connection with you guys, you people out there. So yeah, one way connection in terms of you're not responding to me on camera but you are responding to me down in the comments. Uh, after the first year of making videos, I still think this is one of the best videos we ever made, but we made a video where we went over and, and picked the most over the top fucking batshit comments uh, and essentially just read them aloud. aloud. I, I handed them to Dahlia, she read them aloud to me while trying not to crack up and then I responded to them. Uh, I will, I'll link to that below. It was, it was a lot of fun. I have to say though, since then, I, you know, I, I guess, um, YouTube has algorithms that hide or delete comments that are too trolly. I don't get nearly, I don't, I don't get really any of the comp really over the top, crazy batshit comments anymore. I don't get any of those. So I'm guessing that there must be some sort of an algorithmic bot that is intercepting those and just hiding them or deleting them. So I'm going to, I'm going to look through the settings. If there's like a folder that they get put in or if I can unhide them. Cause I am a little bit curious what the fringes are, you know, interested in commenting about. Um, it, it was, you know, it's a little, it's entertaining. I don't miss it a lot. So maybe I'll just leave, leave it alone. Sleeping dogs lie and all that. But in, in lieu of, uh, of those guys, I thought I would just sort of talk a little bit about the most commented on videos that I've, that I've put up. The most commented on video by far is also the most watched video. That's the, the rant from a year or two ago now. My rant on speaker sensitivity being expressed in uh, voltage versus wattage. Um, but I have to say that, that the one that brought the most dingbat commenters out is the video I did when Rolling Stone revised, radically revised their greatest albums of all time list and put Marvin Gaye, What's Going On, on top in place of Beatles albums, which were like one, two, and four, and six or something. It was some insane number of Beatles albums were in the top 10. And while the greatest album of all time title was a little bit tongue in cheek, and it was largely referring to what Rolling Stone calls their list, so many comments that really did sort of smell like racism, throwing the woke label around like a shitty cologne. Um, that was a, that was a little bit of a, that was a startling one, I have to admit. Uh, I got a lot of comments on the the video I posted, sort of a history of my life in hi-fi, um, talking about all the various gear that I've had, and I got to say that was a that was a really fun one actually to do, <laughs> uh, but and it turned out to be a popular one for you guys, and I, I appreciate that. But I did get a couple of comments in there. One was to something like anyone who still listens to tubes 
is out of their mind or, you know, something like that. And I have to say that the official second rant video, I mean, I've had a couple of mini rants since that first sensitivity one, but the official second rant video is certainly going to be partially about the battle between the, the measurement Puritans and the experiential hedonists. Um, it's, it's a fertile field and uh, I am definitely going to jump into that at, at some point not quite ready to do it yet just because it's gonna, it, that one is going to take a little bit more brain power and things have been seriously seriously busy uh the whole second half of this year we have been very focused on trying to increase production without really changing anything here at at devor fidelity um so moving on from the channel a little devor fidelity uh year-end wrap-up we we had a great year thank you very much everyone and partly because of that we are in a worse back order position than we have ever been in we are currently shipping 096 orders that uh that came in a year ago and we are back ordered projecting out about a year still so while it's awesome that orders are coming in um it's really it's very very stressful for our poor dealer network Customers, while many of them are just incredibly patient, a lot of them are rightfully getting fed up. And I know a lot of them, I know there's a certain number of customers who have canceled orders and that just sucks. I mean, it, it, it really sucks for the customers who aren't getting what they really wanted. It sucks for my dealers who are just having to deal with this backlash. Uh, and so for months now, technically for years, but for months now, we have been very focused on trying to figure out ways to increase our output without changing the way we build anything here. Uh, and it, part of that is getting more space here in the Navy Yard. The Navy Yard, it's got a pretty small footprint. It's an industrial park that has a lot of space in it, but space in the Navy Yard is in very high demand. So, and we have been trying to get more space in the Navy Yard for years. And finally, uh, some rooms on our floor in our building are opening up and we have, we've taken over one space and we've got another one that we are hoping to move into early in 2023. This, this office is within a section of, of our overall space where all of the final assembly is done, packing, shipping, in addition to all of my prototyping and tinkering and design work. So in this part of it, uh, it's, it's the final assembly stuff. And we've had two tables and two to three employees for years, and that's been fine. COVID has definitely made it difficult, and we, we lost all of our employees. And then we gradually, I started gradually hiring back. We had one, and then we had two again. And it's time to increase that. We, we now have three. We are about to have four. But in order to make that efficient, we need more assembly tables. So now there's now three out there. I finished, I built one two weeks ago and finished it. So there's three out there now and there's about to be a fourth. And in order to do that, we needed to unload a, a ton of stuff out of this area and put it into storage. So that is all happening. Um, it's, a, it's a cumbersome process because we're not the only bottleneck in the, in the production chain here birch ply you know post russian invasion birch plywood is still very very difficult to to deal with and to to get uh all of the the lumber mills in the in the u.s at least the ones that we deal with are straining in their production and so quality of um the quality of the pressing, so the, the way that the veneer is pressed onto the substrates and the quality of the veneer themselves. And so that is slowing stuff down here. So as we start to machine into these new panels with oak on them and the, the veneer is starting to fly off and just delaminate from the substrates, we need to then backtrack, figure out, get stuff, get panels replaced, try to figure out if we can fix it. Anyway, so there, there's an enormous number of other issues that, that are not directly related to staffing and assembly tables here. Uh, but we are working on all of them. We are really trying to streamline every single part of production. And we hope within the first several months of 2023 to be able to really uh, double output 
here at Devor Fidelity. And that's the only way we're ever going to dig out of our backorder situation and to be able to actually maybe someday uh, have inventory here so that when a dealer or a customer orders a pair of speakers, we'll have it here um, and we won't have to give them some number of weeks or months delay. Um, so anyway, we're, we are working towards that. And uh, I actually have been over this past year uh, with in, in the production of the O Babies in particular, um, I have actually been grabbing video here and there uh, where I can to show rather than tell <laughs> um, the way the speakers are built here at Devor Fidelity. There are other perennial comments that, that pop up on the video channel about how expensive our speakers are. And I will never deny that our speakers are expensive. Um, it's very expensive to produce speakers the way we do. Um, and at some point I may do a video. I, I did reply to one comment that actually came surprisingly close. He, he gave an estimate of a uh, cost of how much it cost us to make a pair of O babies. And his estimate was actually really, it was pretty dead on. I mean, it was, it was within a few hundred dollars of what it honestly costs us, uh, not including overhead and payroll and, and stuff like that, but, but the actual material costs for us for, to make a pair of O babies. And he threw that number out and he said it was absurd that we, that we then charge $5,700 in, in stores. And I actually remember replying to that guy, um, and just explaining that there's no viable business selling a pair of speakers for what it costs to make them. We would be out of business in a week that, you know, <laughs> something has to pay for the facility, something has to pay for the people who build the speakers. Uh, and in the Devor Fidelity situation, we sell through a dealer network. We don't sell direct. So we don't then just take that cost number and double it and then sell it direct to customers. We sell through a dealer network. And so we sell to dealers and then those dealers have their margin um, because they're paying for their retail overhead uh, and we've got to pay for their expertise. We, you know, I, I strongly believe that our dealer network is the best way to experience Devor Fidelity speakers. You know, having a single place in the world here, let's say here in Brooklyn, is the only place where people can hear a Devor Fidelity speaker or trying to ship a pair of 096s to some customer and expect them to be able to set it up properly with the right kind of a system and evaluate it and then send it back if they don't like it. That, that's not a viable business in, in my opinion. I think our stuff is what it's capable of and all of the intricacies and nuances of putting a system together Absolutely, that is best handled by a great dealer. And our dealer network is entirely made up of great dealers. We have, I am very proud of our dealer network. And I believe, and I truly believe that they serve our customers beautifully. And I think that the customers are better off having that dealer network. That goes in a little bit into uh, why our, our speakers cost what they do. Um, and, and, you know, that and the fact that they are entirely made here in Brooklyn, um, and the video will show that too. I mean, we we are hand cutting the miters for the cabinets on table saws here, rather than in some giant factory with a with a huge uh, V grooving machine. We we believe strongly, especially with the higher end models, that cutting the miters on a table saw just gets the, it, it's the best results. But it is far more labor intensive. Uh, it requires humans who are skilled. And it takes longer. It's kind of funny, you know, this, the whole uh, made in, in Brooklyn or made in New York or made in the USA even, um, while it's genuine, genuinely true here and, and I will show, you know, we'll do, I'm going to post videos of stuff literally being built here in, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's not a very well understood term made in USA or, uh, you know, in terms of watches, uh, Swiss made, you know, the the Swiss watch industry is very careful and very strict about what they let the their watchmakers claim about their watches. And Swiss made has very specific restrictions on what it means to be a Swiss, Swiss made watch. 
And that doesn't mean that it has to be 100% made in Switzerland. There, and there are videos on there on watch channels and stuff like that that go into detail about how not 100% Swiss made, a Swiss made product can be. Same with American made. I remember when, when we first started out, one of, it was one of the earliest uh, consumer electronics shows we did. So this would have been 2002, maybe 2003, something like that. And there was a really well-established high-end audio company here in the U.S. that had recently started making speakers. They were known mostly for their amplifiers. And their speakers were fairly well regarded. They were very expensive. They were very, you know, very nicely done, really well built speakers, uh, in keeping with their amplifiers and in keeping with what they were what they were known for. Um, and so I was at this, I was in Vegas at the Consumer Electronics Show, and these two guys, these two businessmen, came in. For they were uh, they worked for a Chinese company, a big factory, or actually it was a it was a it was a Chinese corporate group that owned a number of factories and they wanted the they wanted my business they wanted to take over the the cabinet production for Devor Fidelity speakers and as part of their pitch they showed me various shots of their um, of their factories and in one of their photos there was a clear shot of a production line in China where this particular brand of made in USA speakers was being built. There were the finished cabinets uh, and it and it wasn't just a matter of finished cabinets getting shipped to the US to be uh, assembled in the US. These cabinets were getting their drivers put into them, the crossovers put into them, uh, and they were getting packed into their packaging, into their cardboard boxes with the brand name right there on the box and made in USA down at the bottom. So uh, things are not always what they claim to be. Um, that's should be obvious, but uh, you know, it's tough. It's tough to know where anything is coming from in this global world that we live in right now. Anyway, that was a big sidetrack. Other comments, there's actually I had this one other comment that I just wanted to talk a little bit about is, so I put it, I put on recently because it has been so busy, so incredibly busy here. Uh, I haven't had as much time to do my normal videos, which would be like just talking about a record. And those take a little bit longer because I, have to, I usually, I do a shot of me playing the record. Uh, and then I talk about the record a little bit. Uh, one of the easiest videos for me to make is if I get a package in the mail or, in, or by UPS and I know it's got something fun or tasty or exciting in it, uh, I'll just set up the camera and I'll do an unboxing video. And so I've done unboxing videos of art uh, and art books. I've done unboxing videos of uh, watches, unboxing videos of you know, records and, and cassettes that I've gotten in. And recently, um, a couple of unboxing videos of uh, fountain pens. Fountain pens made by these tiny, essentially, you know, one and two person operations, uh, which I just find they're so cool. You know, these are these are guys who are literally starting out the way I started out. One person sitting there making something because they love to make it and, you know, selling them in really small quantities. And so I did, uh, there were two unboxing videos recently with uh, with pens in them the, and the comment was something like something like these are cool these videos are cool and all but I hope your videos aren't going in this direction of these sort of male fetish bragging I don't know there was it, it, there was there was a bunch of uh, words kind of thrown in there that made me think that it was maybe English not as a for a primary language or even a translation um, and it did come off as a little bit hostile, but that again, I, I chalked that up a little bit to maybe the translation or the, or the lack of English as a first language, but who knows, maybe it was meant, um, in a mean way, but the, the, the commenter did seem to really like the channel and wanted me to stick to the music, uh, maybe and to talking about speakers. Uh, and yes, that is, that's always going to be the focus 
uh, of these videos. It's always going to be music. It's going to be um, my thoughts on hi-fi. That's the prime directive. And it's my prime directive as a person. This, this channel really reflects my interests and the things that I do other than uh, my family. You know, that, that that's going to always stay separate. But aside from that, uh, I, you know, this channel and me talking to you guys is about the stuff that interests me. And I just, you know, I've done watch videos and Seiko Root Beer Bullshead agrees with me that I'm going to keep doing watch videos because watches are cool. I love watches. I think they're just badass. I've loved them since I was really young, I, I, and I've talked about this in the videos as well. So I'm definitely going to keep doing watch videos. Fountain pens, um, you know, I've been using fountain pens for 50, probably 50 years. Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, my grandfather was a great artist. Uh, he did, uh, he was a painter, he was an engraver, and he did, he did etchings, and he did beautiful um, pen and ink and watercolor. And I, he taught me all, he taught me all of those different things in, in different ways. But I did a lot of drawings with dip pens, you know, actual ink dip pens, crow quills, calligraphy dip pens. And the, the closest thing to a dip pen in, in the normal world is a fountain pen. And to this day, so, um, the, the inktober drawings that I, that I try to do a couple every week, those are all done with fountain pens. There's the, for me, drawing with fountain pens uh, is very satisfying. There's, there's a line quality and a fluidity that I can't get with any other type, with a marker or with a pencil or with ballpoint. None of those even come close. Uh, it's the closest thing to a dip pen without the inconvenience. <laughs> and there's some advantages to, to, um, to a fountain pen, but the fountain pen allows me to have that crow quill type of experience wherever I am. If I'm away for the for the weekend, I make sure that I bring uh, a fountain pen, some some ink, and my little pad, and uh, I'll do my inktober drawings wherever I am. So I'm not making fountain pen videos, or at least the unboxing videos. I'm not making them as a pen as a pen fetishist. I'm making them because because they are, they're beautiful little things, beautiful little machines that are also, uh, at least for me in my world, they're just better at their jobs than other things that are easier to acquire, cheaper, anything like that. You know, it's legitimate to say, why would anyone need a pen that costs more than $2? Totally legitimate statement to make. But um, I love quality things. It's one of the reasons why I love mechanical chronographs. It's one of the reasons why I love cassette decks. I've talked about that. One of the reasons why I love playing records, but also a fountain pen works better than a ballpoint pen for what I need it to do. A record works better than a CD for what I need it to do. And so, um, and for that, for that matter, a vacuum tube <laughs> works better than a transistor for what I need it to do. No big deal. Um, and that's just that's just my take on it. I do I respect that comment, um, and I do I th actually I think I did reply to it. So thank you for your interest. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Don't stop. But that's a little bit of an explanation as to why. And I think I'm I am going to still. I actually just shot this morning. Just shot another unboxing video that I'll post uh, soon. It's going to be a it's a fun one. Um, it's another exquisite, exquisite mechanical device, and you'll see what it is. Uh, and so that's it. So uh, year-end wrap-up. Anything else? Um, the amplifier company, Komoro Amplifier, is taking much, <laughs> it's taking much, much, much longer than I had ever hoped um, to, to come to fruition. The first product, the it's a single-ended 300B stereo amplifier, is essentially done. It's 99.9% .9 done and ready to go. But I have just, you know, I don't have enough time and mental space to get it <clears throat> that last half a percent done and pushed over the finish line to then be able to ship the first 10 production parts. There's just, there are just these tiny little things here and there. 
you know, aside from the experience over the past two years now, maybe more, more than two years at this point, essentially, you know, I'm a speaker guy. I, under, I understand more than any other part of the hi-fi system. I understand uh, speakers. And to that end, I understand um, the transducer part of a high-end audio system. That is um, the, the changing from one thing to another. So in the, in the sense of speakers, it's changing that electrical impulse signal into uh, an acoustical output. Um, whereas, you know, where the opposite is happening in, in a phono cartridge, there's an acoustical or a, uh, there's a mechanical vibration happening and that is being converted into that electrical impulse. So those parts uh, of the chain, I've always understood better. I've sort of, inher I've sort of inherently somehow understood the way that worked and it lent itself naturally to be designing speakers some 30 some odd years ago. Yeah, 30 some odd years ago, mid 80s. And the amplifiers I've always appreciated and I've always had an understanding about how they worked, but I've never, never to the degree that I thought would be needed. And I, and I do believe is needed to, to actually own a company than to produce that product. And it's been a trip, it's been amazing learning about it, you know, this, this sense of a, of a tube amplifier or any kind of amplifier harnessing electricity to make this electrical impulse stream larger, but in a gentle and beautiful way and sort of getting a sense of electricity and voltage almost, uh, almost like water, like a fluid, like this liquid that has a natural desire or urge to flow in certain ways and the amplifier designer's job essentially uh, to guide this flow in important and gentle ways to to sort of get this magical voltage to do our bidding uh, and it's been it's it's been a real trip. It's been really fascinating along the way, kind of learning and talking to, to these people uh, and to a very large extent, uh, you know, Nori, my friend, Nori Asu Komoro-san uh, in particular, but also J.C. Morrison and, you know, these, these really brilliant guys, these, these guys who, who have an understanding of tube uh, circuits and tube electronics the way that I have an understanding of, of the way speakers work. It's been enlightening. It's been awesome, really, uh, to dive deep into that. Um, and we are getting there gradually, um, but I don't even, I don't know. It, hopefully sometime in 2023, we will be shipping product. Um, it, that doesn't seem far-fetched at this point. So anyway, that's 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 the update on uh, Camaro Amp. And um, I, you know, Thank you again, everyone, for a, a great 2022. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm wishing everyone a happy new year. And I will see you at the next video. Thanks. Bye.